These events always go by too quickly, you know. It's hard to believe here we are at the last service for our winter revival. Uh, but God's been good, and I trust you've been blessed. Uh, I trust you sense God doing something in your heart. I know Pastor expressed uh, near the beginning of this year, maybe it was even late last year, but certainly uh, through the early weeks of this year and then Vision Sunday, uh, the idea that he said, I, I don't want us just to have church this year. We want God to do something in our lives. And I believe this topic that we've been addressing here, even just having a passion for God, uh, that's where we move from just having church, really to being the church. And let's... Let's run hard after God. Let's, let's desire Him. Joseph Scriven was uh, an Irish immigrant to Canada. And he had embarked on a military career. That was his desire. But uh, while in college, pursuing that uh, vocation... He was struck ill, and he failed to complete his courses and failed to realize his ambition. He also was engaged to be married as a 25-year-old young man. But on the eve of his wedding in 1844, his fiancée tragically drowned. Several years passed, uh, Joseph Scriven moved to Canada, and uh, he again found love and was engaged to be married, but this time his fiancée passed after a sudden illness. Joseph Scriven would never be married. He spent much of his life uh, with poor health never had regular employment, and wound up mainly just living with other people, including his mother, before he himself died tragically drowning in Rice Lake uh, here in Ontario. In 1855, near Port Hope, Joseph Scriven penned a poem he intended to be read only by his mother. He never sought to have it published or distributed. And these are the words that Joseph Scriven wrote. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrows share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. You know, when, when we sing the songs, sometimes we don't know the story behind the writing of it. And often that lends even a deeper meaning, doesn't it, to the words that we just sing. Tonight we're going to continue our message from last night. This is part two, A Passion for God. We've subtitled it, Markers in Your Experience with God. And really, we, we just looked at the one last night. And before we get to any kind of review, the most important pressing question of the hour tonight is, did you all drink your water today? <laughs> 
If, if you were here last night, I, I hope so. I know I found a, uh, a, a great deal of today thinking about, I got to drink my water. I got to drink my water, all right? But we said that that, that first marker in this, this Christian experience, by the way, the way, all these markers that were indicative of the experience of the psalmist are uh, the common experience, should be the common experience of every one of us as born-again believers. And so we, we talked about this first marker of desiring the presence of God, where the psalmist said in verse 2, my soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? And we talked about this matter of the gravitation to his presence, that it's God that's, that's drawing us. It's God who has the intense desire for a relationship with us. He draws us. Now, we know a little bit about gravitation, don't we? And on earth here, one of the strongest uh, gravitational pulls is, is that of the moon that influences the ocean tides. But, you know, the, the tides of the oceans are inanimate. They cannot resist that gravitational pull. And so they simply submit themselves to it. In the tide comes and, and out it goes. But the sad thing is that as strong as that gravitational pull, I believe the, the gravitational pull and the desire of God for a relationship with men is that much stronger. But yet men are not like the tide. We can resist. And boy, do we dig in our heels and resist. And as has been mentioned several times, we have to make the choice to yield ourselves to God. We talked about the gathering in His presence and the importance of, of corporately coming together to worship and to seek our God and to serve Him together. And in this New Testament age, uh, that's primarily uh, in the local church. We also talked about the glimmer of His presence, and sometimes it could be you go through a season of your life, and it seems like God is so far away. But just like the psalmist, who may have been on his way out of the promised land, on his way to captivity in Babylon, he longed for and he remembered and he looked back from the hill Mizar there in the northern Hermonite range and he reflected and he longed for Jerusalem. And just even from there, to, even if he could catch just a glimmer of God's presence that was good enough for him and he was going to hang on to that even as he went into captivity and so for us too. Uh, you know what, we, we need to catch that glimmer of his presence if that's all we can get a hold of. And just say, oh God, draw me nearer, nearer. So tonight we're going to look at three additional markers. Before we do that, however, let's read our text once again. Psalm 42, and we'll read right through the psalm. We'll have a brief moment where we unite our hearts together in prayer, and then we'll, then we'll carry on and conclude our message this evening. The Bible says, as the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my meat day and night, while they continually say unto me, where is thy God? When I remember these things, I pour out my soul in me, for I had gone with the multitude. I went with them to the house of God with the voice of joy and praise, with the multitude that kept holy day. Why art thou cast down, O my soul, and why art thou disquieted in me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. O my God, my soul is cast down within me. Therefore will I remember thee from the land of Jordan and of the Hermonites from the hill Mizar. Deep calleth unto deep at the noise of thy water spouts. All thy waves and thy billows are gone over me. Yet the Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime. 
and in the night his song shall be with me, and my prayer unto the God of my life. I will say unto God my rock, why hast thou forgotten me? Why go I mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with a sword in my bones mine enemies reproach me, while they say daily unto me, where is thy God? Why art thou cast down, O my soul? Why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him, who is the health of my countenance and my God. Father, we we'll just pray again this evening that you'd guide our, our thinking and you'd guide our understanding. Uh, and, and may our, our, our thoughts be toward you And, uh, Lord, may we consider where we stand in relationship uh, to you tonight and our walk with you and a a revived heart and and what it is to follow hard after God, to have a passion for our Creator, desiring your presence. Lord, understanding some of these other markers in our Christian journey, in our experience with you. I pray that every one of us, without exception, would be helped tonight. And we'll thank you for what you do. In Jesus' name, amen. So this first marker, this desiring his presence, understanding there's something God does in our heart, it's a wonderful confirmation, isn't it, of, of our salvation? It's a wonderful confirmation that we do have a relationship with God, as, and we know our, our desire for Him is nowhere near as perfect as it ought to be. It's nowhere near ever as strong as, as is His desire for us, but it confirms in our heart that God's at work. But there's something else that I, I feel like we don't expect to be part of this, and that's disappointment in the process. For in verse 3, the psalmist says, My tears have been my meat day and night. He says, well, they, that's the enemies of his walk with God, the enemies of God, well, they continually say unto me, Where is thy God? It's a mockery. It's a challenge to my relationship and my knowledge of this God. You come down to verse 10. As with a sword in my bones, mine enemies reproach me. Well, they say, notice it, daily unto me. I mean, they are, (laughs) they they don't wear out in this. They just keep after me daily. They're saying to me, where is thy God? Do you ever feel like God is absent? I mean, here we are desiring his presence, but it seems like, especially from the circumstances and even the challenges of the unsaved world around us, that he's nowhere to be, be found. And we have a disappointment that comes in our walk with God. We have uh, uh, times where we get a little bit uh, discouraged maybe and disillusioned by it all. But I want us to understand that this is part of the normal process for all those who know the Lord and desire His presence and would have a passion for God. For you see, your spiritual journey is not one continuous mountaintop experience. Christian growth. Christian experience. It's not linear. You know, we start at the bottom and we're just climbing, climbing right through our Christian life. But you know, the truth is, in this next little graphic, this is how we want it to be. Right here, boy, I'm climbing up that mountain. Higher ground, boy, I'm just heading for higher ground every day. Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. And that's how we want it to be. But then we realize that it's also like this. And that there are valleys as well as peaks. There are not just always the victories and the triumphs. 
Uh, there are some times where we stumble and we seem to falter and we seem to maybe uh, lose our way a little bit. After all, one of the most familiar Psalms, David said, Yea, though I walk through what? The valley of the shadow of death. He said, Thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. So here, here's the psalmist experiencing such deep disappointment. And it's expressed through his own tears. He's saying, look, my, my tears have been my meat day and night. He said, you know, things that, that hurt me, things that bring sorrow into my life, things that distress me, it's almost all I can think about. I mean, I eat it, I drink it, I'm sleeping even during the night. It's there. The taunts of the ungodly are oft repeated to him. Where is thy God? And truth be known, there are times that circumstances shout so loudly to us, trying to convince us, that everything we know to be true about God from His Word is maybe not true. And the circumstances seem to contradict the spiritual realities that we've embraced. But like the psalmist, we must never doubt in the darkness what we know to be true in the light. God's Word is true. His desire is toward us. His eye is, he's brooding over us. He's wanting us to respond. So maybe you've experienced crushing loss, disappointment, failure. Maybe a little bit like Joseph Scriven. Maybe you've been subjected to the reproach of those who don't know God. Maybe some kind of sorrow. But I want to encourage you in this way. God's delays are not God's denials. You know, we want to shoot straight to the mountaintop, and God says, you know, i got a detour for you. i got some speed bumps. i got some valleys that you've got to go through. Uh, you're, you're going to have to step out of the bright sunshine for a little bit and walk through some, some dark corridors in order for you to get where I desire you to be. Are, are we okay with that? Can we trust God with that? The process is difficult, sometimes disappointing, and it includes seasons of remorse. My tears have been my meat day and night. We're going to talk a little bit about that. In Psalm 80, verse 4, Here's the prayer of a psalmist. O Lord God of hosts, how long wilt thou be angry against the prayer of thy people? Thou feedest them with the bread of tears and give us some tears to drink in great measure. You know, there, there are going to be the seasons of loss. We lose loved ones here. And I've been through that a number of times, both with family members and friends and so forth. And um, sometimes it, it takes a little bit, but ultimately the, the tears and the emotion will just overwhelm me. And the tears will come and they'll, they'll be hot and they'll be profuse. And I'm just crying out to God. But it's part of my spiritual journey. As it is part of the process for you. In your desire for God. There's also not only the seasons of remorse, but the speeches of reproach. As with a sword in my bones, verse 10 says, mine enemies reproach me. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Oh, yeah. The psalmist says, that's not true. <laughs> he says, this is deeper than a flesh wound. 
Uh, ha- have you ever experienced or you've been around where, where someone's experienced, I mean, a, a deep, without getting graphic, but a deep flesh wound that just, you know, I, I've got a brother-in-law, his, his, his uh, one of his boys was at a church picnic. Uh, he had tripped and banged his head on a drinking fountain and, and he just started to bleed. You know how head wounds bleed? And my, my brother-in-law saw the blood, and he passed out. <laughs> I mean, that was it. We, we just, we can't handle a lot of that. But the psalmist said, you know, this is, this is more even than just a flesh wound. This is like a sword just going right down through every layer of flesh right into my bones. I mean, this is, this is excruciating, incredible, unwarranted emotional pain that I'm suffering, unspeakable hurt. Have you ever had people say unkind things to you? People criticize your faith, mock your faith. Listen, God knows. God sees your heart. may not be an easy thing to love your enemies in those moments. To not... Embrace a spirit of bitterness. Jesus hung on the Cal- on the Calvary's cross. May I remind you, suffering for the sins of a of a cursed and fallen humanity, and there on the cross, what's one of the things Jesus prayed? Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. You know, when we go through uh, uh, unwarranted and undeserved hurts, let's remember Jesus on Calvary. Let's remember that God is wanting to do something in our hearts during those seasons of remorse and even when he experiences speeches of reproach against us. Now, we can be disappointed in the process. It's okay to be disappointed in the Christian life. But here's what I'd say to you. Never be disappointed with the God of the process. You know, I I, I don't like sorrow. Hey, who does? I, I don't like trials. And I know as a Christian, death is not our enemy, but I don't like death. I actually, I, I hate death. <laughs> when, when I uh, heard that my brother had passed, for only 45 years of age, I hated it. I didn't like seeing my dad go downhill and kind of languish there in the hospital and then leave. I, I didn't like that. But... I'm not disappointed. I'm not upset with God. He's the one that causes all things to work together for our good. Romans 8, 28. So, <clears throat> these markers in our Christian experience, desiring God, disappointment along the way in the process of it all, but then there's another marker here, and it has to do with determining God's purpose. You know, so we, we're, we experience the hurt. We're disappointed in that part of it. We're not disappointed with God. But then in verse 9, we see that the psalmist asks some questions of God. Verse number 9, I will say unto God my rock, why hast thou forgotten me? Why go I mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? And you could go through the psalm and you could underline other instances where that that three-word question comes up. Why? The why questions. What, what, What is a why question? It's, it's a call for meaning and purpose. Why suggests 
I don't understand. Let, let, fill me in with some more detail here. What, what's the purpose of this? What is the meaning of it? And, and sometimes we're afraid to ask the why question in life. You know, I find children aren't afraid to ask that, are they? Why, Mommy? Why, Dad? <laughs> because I said so, and I'm your dad. I'm, you know what? And Mom says, you know, I brought you into this life, and I can take you out. <laughs> no, that's not a good answer. But, you know, the why questions of, of an inquisitive, inquiring, they, they want to know why. They want to understand life. They want to understand maybe truth and consequences. They want to understand the relationship between their actions and the result. And so do we. And I don't think that there is sin when we are disappointed along life's journey and within our experience with God to ask the why questions. Maybe you can think of some examples. Let's, let's just do this interactive tonight. Maybe you can think of some examples of individuals in the Bible who you either know or you, you believe asked those why questions. They didn't understand what God was doing in their lives or in the context of their experience. Can you give me some examples of such characters? Yes. Okay, Mary, that's a good one. Yeah, what, uh, what on earth is going on here? And um, yeah, but then she understood it, and she turned her praise to God in Luke chapter 2, didn't she? Okay, King David, when he's being hunted like an animal by Saul in the wilderness, you know, thinking... <laughs> Wasn't I supposed to be king? What, didn't Samuel come down and bypass all my older brothers? And, you know, I, he anointed me. You know, what happened? I, I went there, I, I pulled out my sling and a, five smooth stones, and I brought down the Philistine giant. And the king was willing to give me his daughter as my wife. And now he's hunting me like a wild, what's going on? Any other examples? Yeah. Joseph is a great example. It, Job is another awesome one, isn't it? And I believe in the book of Job, he, he talked about bringing forth his strong arguments before God. He had some questions. Even Jesus on the cross my God, my God, what's the question? Why hast thou forsaken me? A lot of good examples. So we have those questions. Why? Because when you have a passion for God, you absolutely desire to know his purpose in your life, his will. You have a desire to know that tonight? God... What do you want in my life? What are you doing in my life? Where are you in the midst of my circumstances? God, I need to know. I want to understand. We're encouraged to seek the will of God, to understand meaning and purpose. Paul wrote in Ephesians 5, 17, Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Now, the truth remains that some aspects of that purpose he will reveal to us as we journey through this life. Through his word, through his indwelling Holy Spirit, through circumstances and wise counsel of godly individuals. But others, this is the tough part now, Others will remain a mystery until we see Jesus. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, The secret things belong unto the Lord our God. But those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever, that they, we may do all the words of this law. 
You know, when it, when it says it revealed to us and to our children, I, I would just add here, parents, never have, hesitate to have good biblical discussions with your children. Let them ask questions. Mommy, Daddy, what, why is this happening in our life? What is God doing? Does God still love us? <laughs> have those discussions. Let the children ask the questions and point them always back to Jesus. So God has purpose. You know, God has purpose in the sorrowing times. Why go I mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? God has a wonderful purpose in our time of sorrow. Tears are a language that's common to man. I think there's a chorus out there that says, tears are a language that God understands. It's true. Jesus himself wept. He takes note of your tears. Not, not the tears of self-pity, mind you, but the right kind of tears. Psalmist said in Psalm 56 and verse 8, Thou tellest my wanderings, put thou my tears into thy bottle. Are they not in thy book? And one day he's going to wipe away all those tears from your eyes and mine. In the sorrowing times. But also, God has a purpose even in the silent times. There are how many years of silence between the Old and New Testaments? Who's the theologian here? 400. 400 years of silence. Imagine that. And that's not the only period of silence in the biblical record. Between Joseph and Moses, there's another 400 years. And we can look at that and say, God is silent? You mean there's nothing recorded of God's working with his people for four centuries? Yet we can never say that those are unimportant years. They're full of divine purpose. Because in those 400 years between Malachi and Matthew... The cultural, spiritual, political, and economic climate of the world is being directly shaped in preparation for the coming of the Messiah. And Paul said in Galatians 4.4, 4, But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law. You know, we, we can look at a cup full of dirt. I had a project like this when I was a child in elementary school. Cup full of dirt, little styrofoam cup, put a bean seed in there. Pour a little water in there. And now that bean is going to grow. You're going to see the plant sprout up. Well, I was so excited about that. I mean, I brought that home. I put it on my windowsill. I went to bed. I woke up the next morning. I went to the window. I grabbed that cup. And nothing had happened overnight. And, you know, it, it was several days. I think it, it was a week or more. And I'd look at that cup a couple times a day, every day. And nothing was happening. But something was happening. And so there are silent times. You know, the psalm said, why, why have you forgotten me? Well, had God forgotten him? No. How about we ask that question? You know, has God forgotten us? What do you think? Have we ever forgotten God? You know, that, that's the shoe that we ought to try on because it's true of us. It may appear to you that God is silent. It may appear, you know, you pray and it seems like your, your prayers just hit a brass ceiling and bounce right back in your lap and they don't seem to go anywhere. But listen, God is always working in your behalf and for your good. And He's passionate. He's desiring a relationship with you. There's one more marker along our Christian experience. We've talked about desiring His presence, being disappointed in the process, and discovering or discerning or determining, I guess, 
his purpose. But then it culminates with this, discovering his praise. And why is this last, kind of in, in the psalm and in our message? Well, let's read verse 5 and verse 11 first. Why art thou cast down, O my soul, and why art thou disquieted in me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance, it says. Verse 11. Why art thou cast down, O my soul, and why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God. And notice the phrase that's repeated again from verse 5. For I shall yet praise him who is the health of my countenance and my God. Praise begins in our hearts. And notice that the praise that's discovered by this psalmist comes on the heels of disappointing uh, uh, circumstances, comes in the midst of, uh, of, of feeling the sting of reproach and the hurt of the words of the enemy, comes on the heels of, of crying hot tears. It comes on the heels of him asking God why. The praise is so much more meaningful when we've gone through all the aspects of this journey. The mountaintops as well as the valleys. I don't know if you're familiar with the song that says God wants to hear you sing. I want to share with you a few words from this precious song. Their chains were fastened tight down at the jail that night. Okay, this is Acts 16. Paul and Silas in a Philippian jail. Still, Paul and Silas would not be dismayed. They said, it's time to lift our voice, sing praises to the Lord. Let's prove that we will trust him come what may. God wants to hear you sing. When the waves are crashing around you, when the fiery darts surround you, when despair is all you see, God wants to hear your voice when the wisest man has spoken and says your circumstance is as hopeless as can be. That's when God wants to hear you sing. He loves to hear our praise on our cheerful days. When the pleasant times outweigh the bad by far. But when suffering comes along, and we still sing him song. That is when we bless the Father's heart. Discovering his praise. And how does that, what does that look like in your Christian life and mine? Well, it begins with some speaking to yourself. The psalmist repeats this in verse 5 and verse 11 again. He says, why art thou cast down, O my soul? He's talking to himself. Hey, hey, self. <laughs> What's going on with you? Why are you cast down, soul of mine? Science says that you and I have the ability to talk to ourselves at the rate of some 1,300 words per minute. Isn't that crazy? And I mean, so we can, have, we can have arguments going on in our head within a short span of time. We could just be speaking and saying and thinking all these things. But the Bible says in Psalm 15 too, He that walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart. And then Paul encouraged us in Ephesians 5, that we should be speaking to yourselves, to ourselves, in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. I'm glad he said, in your heart, <laughs> because some of us could not carry a tune in, you know, in a dump truck, really. We could, we'd have difficulty. But in our heart, we can make melody to the Lord. In our heart, we can sing Him songs. In our heart, we can pray. We, it begins with speaking to ourselves. 
And you know, there's both biblical and unbiblical self-talk, and that's where we've got to be so careful. Because biblical self-talk is always words about faith and confidence and trust in our mighty God. Unbiblical self-talk is talk about failure. You know, Satan is the great adversary. He's the accuser of the brethren. And when we engage in this kind of self-talk, I think we're falling into the devil's trap. How about some examples? I can't do anything right. I'll probably make a fool of myself. I can't control my emotions. I'll never change. I just can't get victory over that habit. I'm a failure. My marriage will never work out. I won't get that job. I'm not good enough. And we can engage it. I mean, in 10 seconds, you can tell yourself a whole bunch of lies. Right? But instead, how about words of faith? And this is what the psalmist said. He said, hope thou in God. Hey, soul, why are you cast down? I don't know. Why am I? Oh, wait a minute. Hope thou in God. The psalmist tells himself, you got to put your hope in God. Words of faith. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. How about that? God's grace is sufficient for me. From glory to glory, I'm being changed by the Spirit of God. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I'm more than a conqueror through him that loved me and gave himself for me. And even more important than speaking to yourself is then speaking to your God those words of praise. As you speak words of faith, you ought to just open not only your heart, but your lips and your mouth and say, oh God, Thank you for being my help. Thank you for being the health of my countenance, as it's put here in Psalm 42. Let's, let's look at that verse again. I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. Okay, this is an in, uh, indication that the help that the psalmist understands and then appropriates in his life is in direct relationship to his knowledge that God's face is toward him, the help of his countenance. Say, oh God, I feel like I'm walking blind. I don't know which way I'm going. I don't know which way is up and which way is down. Why am I so distressed? But then I look to God and say, oh, his face is toward me. It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. And in verse 11 again, For I shall yet praise him who is the health of my countenance, because his countenance is towards me. My countenance changes. And he is my God. He is your God. A passion for God. Think of the psalmist's experience. It began deep within his heart, desiring his presence, like the hard-hunted heart who went to the water, went to the stream, and immersed himself in it, desiring his presence. It takes us through the lonely valleys of life where, yes, we will be at times disappointed in the process. It lifts our eyes heavenward, even as we ask the question, why? And then begin to discover his purpose in our life. And finally, it leads us to that sacred place of worship where we are engaged in discovering his praise no matter what the circumstances. Are these the markers of your spiritual experience? I trust they are. And with God's help, they can be and they will be.